Good morning, everybody. I hope that you are well. Are you wide awake? Viva NACCW, viva! Viva Childcare, viva! Viva! Viva Young People, viva! Viva! I welcome you here this afternoon. Can I have a handheld mic, rather, because this one is a bit short for me. So, to all the members of the high table, um, you've been greeted many times. I'm going to say all protocol observed. Is that okay? But thank you so much for your inspiration. Each one of you have, have led with your dialogue and your sense of commitment to the cause of children so profoundly that I almost feel like we should just go home right now. But thank you so much for, for the inputs received. And to the, the statesmen in our midst, pardon, thank you so much for all that you stand for. Please again, Don Matera. So I want to take you through some of the, the thoughts I have to share with you over the next few minutes. I'm, I'm a father. And besides all the stuff that people have said about me, my greatest role is that of a father. And I'm, I'm privileged to share with you in this space. Because in the lives of children, we matter. We serve. We commit. We enjoy. We engage. We stand with. And that process is fundamental. Is that we believe that we are making a difference as we engage and as we develop and as we talk and lead within this great country of ours. I often say to people, one day when I'm old, and I'm in the fifth old, old age home because I've destroyed the other four because they can't keep me back, I want to be able to sit there and I want my great-grandchildren, because I'm going to live till 101, I want my great-great-grandchildren to run up to me one day and say to me, Papa, Papa, thank you for helping to build the greatest country on earth. And when I look at childcare work in this country, you are fundamental to that story. We salute you. The power that exists in this room today to build a great country is what this is about. Is that a childcare workers, as a profession, we rise today. We rise and we assert our role as we build a progressive and engaging democracy. For the sake of all our children. And so as I, I come today, I, I come to you as a servant of the cause of childcare. I come to you as a servant of the cause of building a democracy for the future generations that is to come. You are the heroes that we talk about. I was the CEO of an NGO for many years and I was overseeing, I think, three or four children's homes at the time, residential care centers. One of my great heroes in the sector is Ashley Teron, who was still head of social work services in the Western Cape that time, and we had a very good, close relationship. One of my, one of my mentors, one of my great mentors is a child care worker. I was the CEO, but my great mentor was a child care worker. And she's here today. Please, Desiree Erinson, would you stand? One of my great mentors taught me about what child care is all about. Sylvia so Vollenhoven, in a book, The Keeper of the Cum, writes these words. She says, We carry our letters, our stories in our bodies. Our stories talk, they quiver, they tap. Our letters make our bodies move. Our stories make our people silent. We feel a sensation, we hear the whisper, soft like my breath. It is about our individual stories. At this 21st biennial convention and conference of child and youth care workers, what we must celebrate is the stories that are being told. We must embrace the stories that are being told. We need to highlight 
and promote and discuss and dialogue about the stories that emanate from the benches, that emanate from the aisles and the discussions to tell us and inform the way forward for childcare in this country. So when we talk about collaborative development or collaborative care, we talk about all of us in the room and those especially who are not in the room to work with us to building the greatest childcare system that this continent has ever seen. When I look at the picture that's on the screen, it's a picture of children in Doma in Syria celebrating Eid just a few weeks ago. And amidst the ruins, amidst the chaos of war, the resilient spirit of children come out and they are willing in a disciplined fashion to sit down and defy war and celebrate. They are willing to make their voices heard in a, in a destructive environment. They are willing to defy the chaos around them and look it in the face and say, you will not cease my celebration. And they rise up. And they celebrate because they know far deeper than most others. And so I want to share eight key thoughts with you today, just very briefly, because I know some of your tummies are rumbling and I want to get to lunch myself. And so just very, very brief thoughts I'm going to leave with you um, this afternoon. I'm going to try and shift this to follow me. In the, in the first instance, I want to share with you, in wanting to shift the culture of poverty to a culture of prosperity, we must ask ourselves which initiatives are strategic for us to focus on. Where are the priorities? Where are the stuff that we know now today is pivotal to create the leverage and the shift that we need to do to create a better dispensation for children? We have the most amazing legislation. DGG, we have the greatest constitution. We have the infrastructure, but we must decide what initiatives are strategic right now. What is it that will move us forward collectively? There are many things that we can do, but there are two or three initiatives that I believe have the power to dramatically shift and solve this particular problem. As I was listening to the speakers, I, I wrote some notes, and, and one of those notes that I, that some of the notes that I made said that we, we have... We have three structures we have to deal with. One is the structure of violence. We don't understand violence. We are naive about it. Because what we see often as the manifestations has a long history that grows from very deep-rooted issues. And we don't understand the structure of violence. The other thing we don't understand is the structure of courage. And the third thing we don't understand is the structure of belonging. And the fourth, and these are the notes I made while I was sitting there, is the structure of freedom based on what the DGG said. We have a free country. And we must possess it, live in it, express ourselves and engage with it for the sake of children. And so what are those initiatives that we have to do? I said to you, I'm a father and something which I enjoy particularly. I have two children. They are now older. Um, they're 24 and 19. But I, I made it my business with my, with my wife, my partner, that we would, we would co-parent with them. We'll include them in the process of parenting. And so they, they taught us and we taught them. One of the things I told them, and uh, I've told this story a few times, is that is that they will never ever be late for school. Oh, did you, did you hear that? MEC, did you hear that? Yes! I told them you will never ever be late for school. And so my daughter started school in the year 2000. She finished now, she's... Uh, she, she finished the honors in industrial sociology. She's going to study further now. But, but I told them that they will never have school. And, and so for 12 years, as I was carting them back and forth to school, and some days um, 
it was close. But I ended 12 years of schooling with each of them, and they never, ever were late for school. But why? Listen, don't applaud that. That should be the norm. That's not something to applaud. It should be the norm for all of us because what we do is when, and this is the point I'm trying to make, when we give children our word, it matters. That's the point. People often ask me, how did you get it right that you never were late for school for 12 years? It's an interesting piece of software I wrote, DGD. I'm willing to sell it to government. But it's an interesting piece of software. It's called www.getupearly. <laughs> www.getupearly. And it was our great joy as a family to co-parent with our children in raising them. So what are those initiatives? One of those crucial initiatives that I believe we must do, for example, is to remove poverty, poverty, to, to move from conversations about poverty reduction to discourses about comprehensive wealth creation for children. Children must imagine not just what it is not to be poor, they must be able to envision the life the constitution of this country promised them. So many people, when we engage in poverty discourses in philanthropy, many people say to me, you know, what, is it, what would it look like if there's no more poverty? And very few people can imagine that. What does poverty alleviation eventually look like? Is it $2 a day for everybody? No. For goodness sake, not. No. We must begin to imagine a world in which children can see themselves as participative, productive, engaged citizens. That's what you are about, ladies and gentlemen. That's the world you are instilling in their minds. That's the joy of being in the business of childcare, of being in the sector of raising successful children. Not just so that they will not be poor, is that they will embrace the wealth of this country. And we must be able to believe and imagine that. When I said we don't understand the structure of violence, I really believe that one of the key things we need to talk about are all the measures to minimize the Courtney Peters and the Zoe Petersons dying at the age of two and one by family members. Create a structure where the MEC just said, we lead children in ways that we ourselves have gone respectfully, boldly, and engagingly. Our national development plan is clear about so much, but it's clear that the lack of skilled citizens and those who are in a state of poor general well-being do not create the opportunities for stimulating high end, the high end of economic development. Thus, the prospects of successful development die a slow death if we don't pay attention to these things, and so too the hopes of children that are born into such a society. The second thing I want to mention to you very quickly is, what is our declared intention with our strategy and our areas of engagement? What are we wanting to do? One of the difficulties that you will know along with so many of our colleagues in the sector is that childcare is difficult. I now have a 35-year-old young man who was in the residential care center when, he, when I was director of the program, and he's now 35, 36 years old. And uh, I'm seeing him care for his family in a substantial way. But part of my job is to stay there, to keep supporting, to keep believing, to keep commenting, well done, to keep sending that message or that call and say, I'm so proud of you. I'm so uh, amazed by what you have achieved. And listen, he is by no means wealthy. He is just committed based on the work that a Desiree Erinson did in the 1994s. What is our declared intention? We have to learn to navigate complexities. We have to learn how things work. We have to design ways that are not silos, 
but servants. We have to design ways that are not silos, but servants. The tools you use must not just be about what you do, but it must create the mechanisms for collaborative care. One of the things I'm very passionate about is that we, we work our way from just pure interventions thinking to, to solutions thinking. And the MEC and the DGG also refer to that. We have to come up with solutions. Just designing interventions is no longer sufficient. So interventions that are not linked to a solution is often money down the drain. We have to come up with things that we can solve for the sake of our children. And we must be bold enough to believe that, that that is possible. We must be bold enough to believe that a better dispensation is possible for children in this country. We must believe that no child in this country will have to die a violent death. We must believe that no child in this country will have to go and, and earn a living while still in school to care for other siblings. We must believe that a strong household is possible for children. We must think of solutions. And unless we are navigating from that point, we keep defeating the noble outcomes of the profession that we hold so dear. What are the solutions? And that's where the brain trust in child care must get together. That's where we have to sit and say, solve this problem. We can talk about child hunger in the country, but how do we solve it? We can ship food out, but how do we solve the problem from occurring? And that's the deeper dialogue that I'm calling this sector to engage with. Because we can pay thousands and, and hundreds of thousands for interventions of year in and year out and year in and year out. When if we only were to go a little deeper into the issue, we could solve it. And we wouldn't have to keep people trapped in our own intervention cycle. But we can lift them out of poverty by thinking about the solutions that are there. Let me go to number three very quickly. Who and what influences our intervention? I'm a public transport user. DGD, I would expect a letter of thanks from you, but I use public transport all the time. I'm a train user and a taxi user. I believe I should be an example to the country. And so every day I jump on a train to go to work. And every day I, uh, if I have a meeting, I jump into a taxi and go to where I have to be. We have to think, what is influencing us? What are the stuff that is behind the philosophy of care? The values that we hold, the interventions we design. And so... We must and always ensure that broad community enriching goals, which leads to progressive solution, fuel our interventions. We must ask ourselves, is this in the best interest of a strong, engaged society? What are the progressive solutions that should fuel our interventions? I remember growing up, I grew up in foster care. My greatest possession that I have today is my foster care placement letter, the report the social worker wrote. I got it as a gift on my 48th birthday from an aunt of mine who had it in her possession. I spent my entire life in foster care. I have a younger brother. He's three years younger than me. I was sent first and then he was sent. And that was our journey. And later in the growing up period, five other children joined that home. And we all lived there together as brothers and sisters. And we became a community of children. It was the greatest experience of my life because it, it, was, it was made possible by the people who cared for us. They were so pivotal in that story. I know what it is to go to bed at night and all you want is somebody to hold you. 
all you want is somebody to hold you. I remember walking to high school and I used to play games in my mind that I was, I was running and I was beating the other kids. You know how you walk to school and the other kid is walking but you make sure you beat them? As you, you set little goals and you put a stone and you watch that stone and then you walk fast. you've got to pass that stone first and then the neighbor's gate and then somebody else. I used to do that all the time because I believed I could run fast, but I didn't really run at all. And so I, I just pretended in my mind that I was playing that game while I was in primary school. And I did that all the time. When I came to high school, in what is grade 10, I suddenly burst out as a sprinter in high school and set a record at Belgravia High School in the 100-meter sprint. Because I kept telling myself that there's something within me. What fuels the interventions? What is the story behind so much of what we do? that builds this broad community, that enriches the goals, that leads to progressive solutions. We have to ask ourselves these questions. I remember one day the, uh, I was in primary school and the caretaker got sick. And so they announced over the intercom at the school, they announced the caretaker sick and each of you have to clean your own classrooms. And I was about in what is then standard three. What is that, grade five? So I was going home to foster care, and I thought I wasn't feeling like going home that day. So I said to the teacher, I can sweep our classroom. I was that dilly. Yes, I was. So I offered to sweep the classroom, and uh, I cleaned the classroom, and I went to home. And the next day, Mr. Goldsmith, the, the caretaker at the other little primary, was still sick. And again, I put up my hand, and eventually, he was sick for, a, for about a week. And I went to the principal's office, and I said, sir, can I sweep the school? And so I started sweeping the school, and I cleaned all 22 classrooms in the afternoon. And I did that for three years. And I became Mr. Goldsmith, the caretaker's best friend. And eventually the school principal trusted me so well that one day when Mr. Goldsmith was sick again, the school principal called me up and says, Davids, could you open the school? I was like, oh, I have arrived. I became the best sweeper, not in soccer, but in sweeping, because <laughs> I loved what I did. Every day, I swept that school. It was my joy to arrive at school in the morning and see children smile at how clean their classrooms were. I washed what was then green boards. During the school holidays, I went to go and, and polish the school floors with yellow polish. You remember that yellow polish? I cleaned toilets. And I did that for, five, for three years in primary school. Simply because I wanted things to do. I had all this energy. Because what we must talk about is stop isolating little patterns that dictable outcomes for children, but allow them to richly engage with life around them and see how they blossom. Number four. In designing strategies, it was wisely choose to use the influence model instead of the power model. The influence model is far more greater than the power model. We have to influence at so many levels. We must grow our influence across domains to ensure that we can ultimately influence those with power because we understand how to use both to achieve the goals of a better life for children. We must grow our ability to sit down with decision makers. Become influential about so much of what is required to happen for children. I have a memory box. Somebody referred to a memory box here. Was it you, MEC? Or somebody referred to a memory box. I have a memory box. I've had it since I was in foster care. Every child in my home has a memory box. I now have a Wendy house in my yard filled with memory boxes. Because I taught them from day one, you save things, you put things away, this is your story. We have movie tickets, we have bus tickets, we have train tickets, we have mints, we didn't eat in restaurants. But it tells a story, we put it in the memory box, and the memory boxes are filled with all kinds of things. Notes, letters, cards, papers. Because one day... I'm teaching them to influence, tell your story.
take a story from the memory box and tell it. Many nights we sit down as a family and we pull one of the memory boxes out and we allow the kids to tell us stories about what that particular item was. We can teach our children to be powerful and assert themselves in many different ways. But if they don't know how to become influential, we simply teach them an obsession with self-assertion. We have to teach them to come alongside, to build with, to seek to understand, to influence, to create consensus, to build strong bonds. What new intelligence are we employing to address the issues we want to solve or shift? One of the crucial initiatives that I believe we must do is that we must collectively become the best at what we do. We must be open to new intelligence that challenges anything that we hold to be true and embrace learning to ensure better societal outcomes. We must be open to change. We must be open to embrace new learnings. In 1984, I was working in Guiani in the sort of southern part of Mozambique, northern east part of the country. And um, I got arrested by the police for the work that we were doing. And they drove me all the way to a uh, prison in Varambat. Now, you don't want to be in a prison in Varambat, what is now called Bella Bella. And um, besides the stay there, one night while I was there, they brought in a young boy, no more than nine years old, they brought into the prison, about the middle of the night, and they put him in my cell. And he was about nine years old, and they, they sort of, you know, threw him in there, and it was about two o'clock in the morning, and I, I kind of wondered, where does this nine-year-old come from at two o'clock in the morning? And the story was they had picked him up at five o'clock already, drove around with him. That's what they did. And then eventually decided they have to put him somewhere, put him in my cell, and accused him of stealing cattle, nine years old. We mustn't be naive about the children's stories. We must listen, we must engage, so that we grow our intelligence base for how we engage with people. It is important. There's a, there's a body of literature out there, mountains of it. But nothing is as crucial as the stories people tell us. And we have to listen. One of the children one day came to me while I was the director of an organization that had child care centers. And he had broken his shoe. It was the start of the school. And you know how we buy school shoes for children and school uniforms. And the shoe had broken. And uh, it was just like a week into the school year, and he came into my office, and the whole shoe was hanging like this. It was all broken and, and gone. And I, I said to him, your shoe is broken. It's, it's one, one week old. How can your shoe be broken? I said, these are new shoes. And he leaned over the desk in my office, and he said to me, it's broken because you buy us cheap shoes. We must become the best at what we do. We mustn't settle for quick solutions. We must be willing to go deep into the story. We must be willing to listen. Are we innovative with what we are doing and, or are we merely regurgitating what others are doing and what we are, or what we ourselves have always done? How innovative are we? Look for the new. Look for the alternative. Look for the different. Find ways. Nothing is important in 2017, and as we embrace this new era of childcare, that we collaboratively look for stuff that we can do, have never considered, must do, is important to embrace. And it's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's entirely up to you. I salute the bravery of the childcare community. I've been there, I see how hard it is. But what we need to do is to rise as a collective body, collaborate, stand together, become the best at what we are, train ourselves, develop ourselves, read about, and engage and listen, and tell the story of what progressive childcare is about.
That's the mission. That's what we are called to. And I know how hard and lonely and desperate it is that when you're sitting with broken children, how hard that reconstructive process is. But nothing is as crucial as keeping our ears and eyes open to look for new, alternative, and different to shape the dialogue around child care. Talk much about impact, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about impact because that in itself is a, it's a loaded issue. I want the children of this country to know that there's a better future for them. But let me share one thought with you around this. The childcare community mustn't become a community isolated from the general populace. It's important that we stay connected to the communities that we find ourselves in. And we have to help ourselves move from what I call program or project impact to what I call geographic impact. It's not just okay that the children in our centers are doing well. We have an obligation to ensure that the children in the community around us, that there's a sense of geographic impact based on what we do. Is that if you're in Delft or in Kayalicha, or you're in Manenberg, or you're in Alexandria, or you're in Mafikeng, or you're in another city, it's important that we, our collaboration, results not just in smart programs, not just in great projects, but res results in what is ultimately a better society, a better community, a safer space for children to grow up in. That is what we must achieve. That is where we must go to. We must measure geographic impact. If we've been there for a long time, is the community safer off? Is the community a more prosperous society as a result of our contributions to that process? Leadership is the art of defying chaos. Leadership is the art of defying chaos. We refuse to submit to chaos. And we rise like these children on the picture to, em to assert, embrace, influence, and state our message loud and clear for all stakeholders to hear. Love is the art of defying violence. It's the art of looking at them who seek to hurt and being able to stare them down. I've been robbed on public transport more than I, what I care to remember. I have. But it hasn't deterred me. Because if good people don't use public transport, it won't change. Come on, South Africa. Come on, South Africa. That is our system. And if our children must use it, then we must. And I'm challenging you to rise above the small stuff so that we have love that defies violence. We must never accept chaos and violence as a necessary order of life, for it is not. Both chaos and fear have one goal, and that is to diminish our greatness and to disrupt our progress. For when there is chaos, our vision becomes blurred, and when there is fear, our trust whittles. We must want nothing more than to lead bravely amidst the chaos and to defy its stranglehold and to, and to see progress and trust as the permanent outcomes of the leadership that we provide. And therefore, I close with these words. Ladies and gentlemen, heroes of the child care community, I call you to with integrity 
Rise to the leadership role that has been entrusted to you. To make this 21st biennial conference the most pivotal moment in childcare in this country. To shape the dialogue that will forever change. That we are no longer just participants and mere bystanders in the process. But we professionally, collectively, in an engaging way, collaborate across transversally. Because we know, we know that if we don't, we would have failed our children. When I was 11 years old, in that foster care home, and I was desperate for just someone to to see me. You know what that means to see you? You're tired of being invisible. Your invisibility becomes a burden you carry. And you just became weary of being invisible. And you want someone to even just mention your name. As I walked home from that day, and I came to the house in Belgravia Road, and I stopped outside the door, and I was going to go in, and there would be other children there, and there would be a horde of people. And my brother, who was younger than me, he was coming from school at the same time, and he crept up quietly behind me. I didn't hear him coming, just as I was about to open the door. And my hand was on the doorknob, and before I could turn the doorknob, he flung his small arms around me, and he held me tight. He held me tight. I had no idea he was there, but somehow he saw my invisibility. My brother today, is the master of the high court in Kimberley, Craig Davids. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are the heroes that we salute today. You are the people that make the difference. Let's tell a new story in a new era about childcare. Thank you very much.